Hello and welcome to Voss Vignettes, Lessons in Leadership. This is the podcast of Voss Fellowship, a coaching community dedicated to creative problem solving, interdisciplinary networking, and innovative personal and professional growth. I'm Joe Schubert, coach and founder of the Voss Fellowship. And I'm Steve Durgan. I'm a fellow at Voss and the director of Mastermind Development. And I'm Johnny Button, also a fellow here at Voss and the director of Digital Media. So today we are joined by Dr. William Clark. Dr. Clark, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. And Dr. Clark, you have uh, 15 years of experience in workforce development, uh, developing sustainable revenue strategies for growing businesses, working alongside uh, our saw city governments, nonprofit administrations, uh, public housing operations, and you even have uh, a five-year church plant, was it, that you were just telling us about? Yes, five years. Wow, congratulations on that. <laughs> that is a, a great... <laughs> Diverse uh, work experience there. He's doing a lot. He's doing a lot. So, so today we wanted to ask the question, um, what is the best way, way to raise money for your business? Um, I know that um, for a lot of new businesses, um, sometimes we can kind of get pigeonholed into thinking that sales and revenue are the only way that we can gain income for our businesses. Um, but I wanted to ask just to begin, what are some different ways that you can raise money for, for your business? Yeah. So, you know, that's kind of, addressed which the way you framed this joe um honestly obviously when you're developing a business you're selling a product or service that you're looking to offer to the market and uh, you're looking for customers consumers to purchase the product to support your work etc um, one of the difficulties of building a business of any kind whether it's nonprofit, for-profit ministry whatever the case may be is getting access to the startup funds uh, that will allow you to not only launch the business, but also get a nice runway to sustain the business or at least get on the road to sustainability. So I specifically work with nonprofits and ministries to build their programs, their infrastructure. And I often advise a couple of principles to get them started even before they start, quote, selling a product. And then mm. I'll talk about selling for a moment. Um, but when, when they're starting out, particularly in the, in the nonprofit space, a lot of people assume that they're once they become a 501c3 organization, they can start tapping into grants and competing for what I call major or serious dollars. This is, you know, high five figures, six, seven figure dollars to do some sort of community work that they feel deeply connected to. And the reality is that's not going to happen. That's not how that works. You know, just like mm. in any infrastructure or any situation, the bank does not lend you money if there isn't a history of generating revenue, whether it's you owning the business and generating revenue through that, or you having a job to support or personally guarantee the loan, right? It's the same way in the nonprofit world. While you don't have to pay the money back, founders of foundations, excuse me, who are giving out major money, six to seven figure dollars, are not going to give away their dollars to organizations that are unproven entities, so mm. they're going to require you to have the infrastructure in place. So while you're waiting to build that, and, and we can address that if you want to at a later point of podcast, one of the things that I advise my clients to do early on is to implement and institute the, the principle of tithing to their nonprofit. Now, for those of us, I think we're all believers on this particular podcast. We understand that principle where it comes from. For those who don't know what that is, uh, from the Christian world, tithing is you as an individual giving 10% of your increase to the ministry or to the church where you are being fed at, right? And mm -hmm. it's 10% every time you receive a paycheck, 10% every time you make a sale, 10% every time you do something that adds revenue to your coffers. I'm not going to get into the debate whether it should be pre-taxed or post-taxed. That's a whole separate conversation, but the <laughs> principle still remains. Uh, years ago, I read a book that talked about the 70-30 rule, which is for entrepreneurs that are starting businesses, 70% you live off of, 30% you break it down in tens. 10% 10 mm -hmm. goes to God, 10% goes to savings, and 10%, get this, goes to investments. So right. if you are betting on yourself, you can choose to invest in your business, whether it's your nonprofit, your ministry, or your business. So for nonprofits, I encourage founders to tithe. Number two, nonprofits have to have a board of directors. Mm -hmm. I typically advise nine to 11. 
And they have to, among other things, contribute to the organization. So in the early stages, I, inquire, I require or at least encourage my clients to have their board members tithe and match the giving of the founder. And hmm. even before you start to do any other fundraiser, before you start to pursue funds through foundations and grants, you already have an individual giving donor, donor base between yourself and your board. And then the third step to all this is host a listening party where you share the mission and the vision uh, with family and friends and invite them to match your giving on a biweekly basis. And again, you host more parties and you host more people to meet that giving level. And so before you even start to pursue all the funds, you have monies coming in. I think right. that principle is true for any business that's getting started, whether you're starting a t-shirt business, a shoe business, a car wash business, a bakery. Invite people who are part of your inner circle to become early investors, whether you decide to return that, you know, with some sort of ROI or not, or you just ask them to support you. Take that same principle. You tithe, have your family and friends tithe, and then take those resources and invest. And if you decide to tap into any, you know, lending products or tools from the bank, great. But at least you have an individual giving donor base to help you get off the ground as you start to figure out how to make those sales where your customers are now supporting your work. That's good. And I think that's something that especially, you know, younger entrepreneurs or people who don't have as much experience in business wouldn't um, think to do. And even, even you know, I know for us, one of the things that we tried to do with Voss um, was not going to debt right away. We wanted to be able to just kind of bankroll this off of our own pockets and our own work ethic. ethic. Um, but it is definitely a challenge when you're only relying, like you were saying, on, okay, when's the next sale coming in? When's the next client coming in? Um, because it gets tight. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, and so I, I wanted to ask, or actually I'll let one of the other guys ask, we wanted to get on some, some, some mistakes people make. So, yeah. Yeah. So what are, what are some of the most common mistakes that you see business leaders make as they're trying to start uh, raising money for their business? Yeah. They try to eat the whole elephant at one time, you know, and it, it becomes a huge challenge. And this is when you see people quit, get frustrated, they give up way before the business has a chance to do something of substance, right? And so the old adage is you eat an entire elephant one bite at a time. Um, and, and there are so many rabbit holes to kind of go down when we talk about this, but I'll take your example, Joe. We talked about not going into debt. I've been there, done that, got the t-shirt and the sweatband to prove that I've <laughs> done this and it can be tough. Now, don't get me wrong. There are always going to be examples where it works. You go into debt, you bet on yourself and timing is just on, on your side or in our world, Joe, right? The favor of God just blesses it and there's nothing you can do about it. If, if someone's blessed, they're blessed. If, if the timing is right, it's just right. But for the average person who's trying to be as thoughtful as possible, considerate as possible of their journey, I think it can, it can be a mistake to get into debt without a clear revenue plan that is already working. I, 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 and I want to be clear about this, right? I'm not talking about revenue projections, expectations, what you hope to do. I'm talking about, in the case of this podcast, for the sake of argument, if you guys get into debt and have yet perfected, mastered, or even tried to sell sponsorships, ad spots, co-host co, uh, co, uh, spots where people pay to be on the podcast, if you haven't mastered those three things, then there's no reason to get into debt because you have no way to pay the debt off. Right. Right. There's no argument. So at this point, I, I think one of the biggest mistakes is people pursue more money than they can handle and more money they're able to steward, whether it's debt or even if you luck into getting a major grant for my nonprofit folks, you can luck into getting a major grant and realize you're screwed just after you get the check, because now all these expectations are now on you. Again, you don't have to pay the money back, which is great, but you have to do reports. You have to recruit clients. You have to systematize everything. You have to scale up. You got to hire staff, got to hire auditors, got to hire HR director, got to hire this, this, this person, this. And you thought it was just, hey, I'm going to take this money and serve the community. No, it's, right. it's a business, right? And I think that's one of the other things I'll, I'll mention here, whether it's a ministry a nonprofit, this podcast, whatever, business is business, right? And if you don't have good business acumen, good business practices, take the time to learn and or take the time to build a team around you 
that can help you build a successful business that actually does work and function. Right. I love that you laid out kind of this, this sequence of, uh, you know, implement a principle in your community, you know, of your inner circle of being a part of this somehow, you know, if it's a nonprofit, maybe that's a donation base, you know, if it's a for-profit, maybe you get some kind of, I sign on as like a customer rewards person and I'm a regular or something like that. Um, and then, you know, doing that list, you know, you listed out like setting up your board, having them match the founder in some way. Um, I love the listening parties idea before you get to things like big grants, uh, mm-hmm. before you get to these other pieces. Um, I'm wondering if you could flesh out a bit of the for-profit side of that. So I was just starting to do it. My brain was turning those wheels when I was thinking about kind of, okay, how do you, how do you think about the donation thing in a for-profit context? Maybe it's just a customer commitment program. Um, but yeah. can you talk us through that a little bit for the for-profit folks listening? Yeah, absolutely. And I'll use this podcast, right? Um, and I don't know what you guys have going on. So either I'm going to affirm some things or I'm going to offer something different that you have not considered. But but let's go back to this whole debt situation, as I mentioned, right? It doesn't make any sense to do it at this point. If I was advising you guys to, uh, you know, in terms of building this podcast, obviously build your consumer base. People are going to listen. You do that organically and or intentionally through your marketing. But in terms of funding the podcast, I would strongly consider having individual donors who support the podcast. Think about public mm. radio, right? When you listen to public radio uh, and they every now and again, they mention the individual donors that just sponsor or support the work. That's key. What you're selling to your sponsors is this good quality content where we talk about this, Mm. Right. They may or may not have a business that they are operating, but they love the content or they love the content on behalf of someone in their life and inviting people to become a weekly donor at the five dollar level. Think about how Patreon works uh, or other platforms, ten dollar level or $20 level. And at every level you get something what, what you know that you give them something. But what's important is that you build this individual donor base. Second phase to this is to figure out which types of businesses would be great sponsors of this content. Mm. Every business owner is not a fit because of your principles, your values, your content, where you're going Mm. with it. So when you determine the type of businesses that are a fit, right, for what you are uh, talking about or what you believe in, approach them to support a sponsorship package over six or 12 month period, right? And they can give every month, every three months, every six months, or give it all up front. And you're going to give in exchange for those dollars, ad spots, you know, a prominent positioning on your website or your post or your website, uh, maybe a pre and post podcast spot. Maybe we've paused in the next 10 minutes and recognize the sponsors, whatever, however you work it out. Right. Uh, that, that, that's how you do it. And then you start to scale more and more and more. And you start to realize a couple of things. The market, your customer, your paying customer will begin to dictate what they think is a better fit for their dollars. And you begin to master that process. You begin to improve it. And I'll share this principle for those who are believers. As Joe mentioned, I am a pastor. We're taught this principle in scripture. You start out being faithful over a few things and systematically you learn how to be faithful over many things, right? Right. Before you start taking on debt, before you start taking on large scale sponsors who have major demands that you're not ready to handle, start small, start with the individual $5 guys, the $10 people, the $20 folks, and maybe you're charging $1,000 a month if you can get up there to small businesses, mid-sized businesses, and then you start to scale up, deal with more sponsors. So that's an example of how that can work with your podcast. That's such a, you just nailed such a great like microcosm, you know, because even, even the podcast, it seems like such a small thing to tackle how to build revenue around one service even, you know? Um, but I think that was just such a gold nugget for us. I saw we're, I have, we have our notes up in front of us as we're asking questions and you know, I'm just taking notes. typing feverishly as you're coming. <laughs> so this is awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. And it's helpful to hear somebody who's just seasoned in these things and knows these things to just fluidly describe, Hey, you could try this. You could try this. You could try this. <laughs> so for yeah. me, this is already so valuable. Really appreciate let me, this. let me, let me draw more on this, right? Cause I don't Please. know if there's gonna be a visual to this podcast, but you know, we're all on the screen. 
COVID hit 12, 14 months ago, mm-hmm. and many businesses struggled to transition to an online platform for a number of reasons. The primary reason most people struggled is they don't know or didn't know how to connect online in a way that provides quality AV, right? Quality video, quality audio. I'm looking on the screen. All of us have reasonably quality, reasonable quality video and pretty much high quality audio. Hopefully I'm coming through clear. Consulting on that level, helping churches and businesses that desire to become more prominent in their online offerings is another way for the podcast to work, right? Featuring people in their products, right? Where you become affiliates. Uh, let's say I was selling a book and I say, hey guys, we'd love to be on a podcast to sell the book. You become one of the exclusive partners that sells the book or the widget that I'm offering if it's a fit and people can get the product by going to Voss's you know, podcast website where you get a cut of it, right? Becoming a wholesaler. It, it, again, there are ways where you could just continue to build on this and monetize this that can help your business grow. And again, we did not mention debt right at all i'm not sure you're going to need it right if you continue to build slowly but surely but that's how you can grow your business brilliant stuff brilliant stuff um i wonder so if those are some common mistakes that we touched on earlier um what are some other blind spots if any that you think of for people going into business funding opportunities that we tend to miss um I think like Joe said, a lot of us are just focusing on internal revenue sources, but I'm wondering just if, you know, you're young in the business, you're in your first three, five years, this is your first startup or something like that. And you just don't know the landscape. What are you liable to miss? Is there anything you wanted to add to that, Dr. Clark? Yeah. The biggest thing I'll say among uh, that I see with my customers that that's a big miss is the lack of planning. And back back when I was younger and wanted to start a business in the late 90s, early 2000s, uh, business plans were really popular. So I grew up in an age where Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Google were launching and they pioneered uh, what people later coined as kind of, and I'm, I don't think I have the term, the proper term, but they brought products quickly to the market for immediate customer reaction, mm-hmm. right? They coded pieces of the platform and immediately brought it out for reaction, interaction, and they took customer feedback real time and then tweaked it. Think about your cell phone. They launched a new product, uh, a new software I, I, I operating platform, and people begin to play with it. And then mm-hmm. they tweak it. And then you get updates every two weeks, every month, Clubhouse is updating almost every week or two. They're not shutting down the platform to fix it. They're fixing it real time where they're tweaking because of customer reaction. And what that has taught many business leaders and business owners is honestly developing a plan on the back of a napkin is is still good enough to kind of launch this thing. Unfortunately, a lot of my clients, they don't develop the plan on the back of the napkin at all. Mm. Right. And so instead of helping them raise money, I ask them to pause all efforts so we can plan out how to raise money, right? What do you have that's fundable? What do you have that's supported, that can be supported by customers? As I'm not in the business of critiquing products, I'm not a Shark Tank type guy where I'll tell you this is a bad idea unless it's a really, really bad idea. I'm more in the business of saying, okay, this is what you want to do. Great. How do you get from here to there? What's the plan? And I'm not suggesting we build out a full business plan with a full prospectus unless you're going to go after some debt, right, which may require that. But what I am saying is you need to have a plan that talks about we're going to launch this particular business and this product, and we want to get here. But what are the major steps we see that need to happen? Now, I want to tell people this piece uh, before I let this topic go. Um, It requires faith to launch a business. And I'm not talking about in the spiritual sense. We can go there if you want. But but faith in its purest sense is all about action. Mm. All right. If you believe that you're called to do something in the business world, launch a business, launch a podcast, it takes faith and a little bit of crazy to actually do it. Yes. All right. Now, here's the here's the key to all of this. And I'm tying this, this thing together. You put the plan together. Don't stress out about it. You put faith into action and you start working the plan. Mm. That's it. But the last element to all of this is to be open-minded to notice when you need to shift gears. You won't know what you need to know until you start taking action. 
if you believe that you're going to get this transfusion or transmission by osmosis of the perfect plan to launch the perfect business, you're sadly mistaken. A lot of us are going to learn what we need to learn about our business when we're actually doing it. So if you can take action as fast as you can, it will accelerate lessons learned. It will show you other doors that will be open to you. It will show you doors that are closed to you. It will prove to you what you're doing is right or wrong. It will, it will tell you whether you need to take a step back or you need to shut it down and just try a whole new idea. But you got to have a plan, take action, and then be open-minded and keep your eyes open to see what lessons are being taught. I know that anybody who's tried anything <laughs> uh, and took taking that risk is nodding with you right now in yes. your car or wherever they're listening. <laughs> I know we're all nodding here, <laughs> boss. So <laughs> that is so true. And yes, it's an accelerator of lessons learned. That is such a, a gold nugget to take away. I hope people are Absolutely. taking notes. Yeah. And, and this is just reminding me of our, our, our latest episode. We were talking about, um, stages of community and conflict and how even in within Voss fellowship, um, you know, when I, when I had this idea last summer in the middle of COVID, I had this like very like picturesque, this is going to be organic. And we're going to have like one major service and everybody's just going to want to do it. Cause you know, it's, it's, it's needed. And you're right. It, you know, I think of Johnny, Johnny is a first mover with a lot of technology. He's always on the betas for oncoming apps. And, and in a sense, the first few years of business really are beta testing. You're, you're, you're getting customer feedback. You're realizing this thing that I thought was going to be my core offering is really just a periphery of what my business really should be or, or needs to be for who actually is engaging with it. So you're, yeah, you're, you're definitely like putting off all the lights in our heads. I, all of us are nodding around this table right now. Johnny, do, did you have something to add or? Yeah, no, I just think it, it, it's exactly like you're saying. I think that we've found as we've just tried different things that the things that we thought were going to take off don't always take off. And the things that we thought <laughs> were just going to be this side project are the things that people are like, oh, I need more of this. Right. And it, it, there's trial and error, but it, but it requires us to move. Yeah. And can I just speak to this too? For business owners who are listening, and when you hear the commentary from Steve, John, and Joe, you not only need to be open-minded to what's going to be revealed to you, you also need to be uh, need not to be stubborn and more flexible to respond to what the market is clearly dictating to you. If you're so rigid that your plan is the only plan that can take place, you're going to miss the direction and what I would call the divine direction that's mm. been given to your business. If your customers are giving you the precious gift of feedback, just, let me just put my pastor hat on. This is God speaking to you, <laughs> right? Right. This is how God speaks. God, I mean, yeah, for those that are super believers, he can't come down in a thunderous cloud and speak to you. Those moments are great, but more times than not, he speaks to us through various angels. And those angels are literally your customers who are giving you the gift of feedback. Wow. And you've got to accept this and realize, okay, this is divine direction. This is the higher power, whatever you want to subscribe to it. I call him God uh, and he's speaking to me and I need to follow that voice because they're telling me this is the path for this business. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Steve just jotted that line down. You won't know what you need to know until you start taking action. That was great. Um, so I would love to give our listeners a very like tangible um, takeaway from this, this as well. I think you've given us so much information already, but you had mentioned mm when we are planning for this uh, podcast that you um, have either trainings in place or that one of the, the services or you provide for people is you teach them how to raise a hundred thousand dollars in six months. Could you, can you explain that a little bit to us? Yeah. So this was born out of a desire to help organizations, particularly nonprofits who have yet to reach the $50,000 a year mark. And again, the, the caveat is you've have not earned 50,000 a year every year for your business. And so a lot of people are looking to get off the ground They're looking to launch and they're trying to figure out, okay, how do I do that? So we talked about a number of ways to do that uh, on this particular podcast. There are a bunch of revenue sources I talk about with my nonprofit clients. One of which we talked about was through individual donors. We call them donors on the nonprofit side. You can call them individual sponsors on your side of the house, the uh, mm -hmm. for-profit side. So individuals giving is one way. And again, if you just simply look at a good 19 to 20 people tithing, um, 
let's just do the math real time while we're doing this. 100 yes. people giving 26 weeks. That's 2,600. Yeah, you need about 38 people, 39 people giving 2,600 a year mm. to generate $100,000 uh, in 12 months. And again, double that. Uh, what is that? 80 people to do it in six months. It's not hard to do when you think about family, friends, their network, and especially if you have something that's just positive. Here's the other thing, too. You want to teach people how to give when you're doing an individual donor piece before I move on to other ideas. Please. When you and the whole teaching thing is not about you having a lesson. What ends up happening is when you abide by the principle of tithing to your business, it becomes much easier for you to explain to other people how they can do it, right? Hmm. For me, a tithe is 10%. That's what the Bible describes. But for other people, they may not be able to do 10%. They may do 5% because they have never heard of this principle. Or some people may say, nah, man, I'm giving 15, 20% to the business because it needs more than that. The whole point of this is disciplined giving, right? Hmm. Dumping money in a business is a... Not, it's a bad idea. It's just a, it's a bad idea because you just don't know what you don't know. So disciplining your giving towards this business is more sustainable and more helpful to building a business. From there, you can share that same principle with other people, whether they're giving you $5 or $200 every two weeks. It's the same principle of consistency, right? Consistent giving. Another way to do this in six months is to build a, a donor base of sponsors, small, medium, or large sponsors that are giving at a certain level. Of course, you can have one business give you $100,000. That'd be awesome. Solve all your yes. problems. You can have two businesses give you $50,000, four businesses give you $25,000, five give you twenty, dollars so on and so on. There are different businesses of all types and stripes. And again, you can ask for it up front. You can ask for it over a six-month period, a quarterly basis, or some businesses may want to tithe to you. Right. And it's not a faith thing. It's just the principle of giving every two weeks when we close our books, every month when we close our books, we're going to give this amount towards the sponsorship amount. And again, you want to set a goal for every business and then uh, have them meet that goal. You can do that in six months. In terms of this podcast, you can do a bunch of, uh, you know, multi hour fines where you're doing a special cause or a special idea. Maybe you're doing a 24 hour podcast episode uh, around how to launch your business, getting 30 people to launch a business today. Mm. So how do you do that? You get individual sponsors, you get sponsors uh, from businesses, and you get other, you get the 30 people who are going to sign up for this to sign up for this 24-hour intensive where you're going through a bunch of content. Maybe this content is a part of that. It's on replay, and you're having people take action, but to participate, you got to pay into this. And let's say you do this a couple of times over the next six months, that will get you to your, get this, $100,000, right? So there are a number of ways you can do this for your business. Um, and of course, I mean, we don't have time to go over uh, a lot of ideas, but it's all about planning. That, that's the big point of this. It's not about the idea. The idea is relevant. My ideas may be corny. It may not work. That's not the point. It's about how do you plan out this thing and make yeah. it happen. Yeah. Wow. This is, this is so yeah. good. I mean, I'm even just thinking about like the, the trope that I know so many people fall into, whether it's a business or any project and it's the whole, like, if you build it, they will come. But like you're saying, you, you are laying the foundation and you are almost like teaching them. This is how you walk through the front door. This is where you sit. This is how you're going to interact with me. <laughs> you know? So this is, yeah, this is great. Helping me to dream right now. I know that yeah, definitely so. for sure. <laughs> um, well, so I, one of the questions we wanted to ask as well, was um, especially as we're starting to close this episode off a little bit, is what resources would you recommend to new business owners or businesses? Whether that's a you know a book that was inspirational to you, different podcasts, thought leaders, um, organizations, or websites. We would love to hear uh, things that you would want to recommend to our listeners. Yeah, um, so I'm going to recommend these resources. I'm not sponsored by any of these folks, but these these individuals have been valuable to me on my journey. Um, so for the real estate folks out there, I would encourage you to go to wherever you listen to podcasts and pull up content from a podcast called flip to freedom, the flip mm -hmm. number two freedom. And it's by a guy by the name of Sean Terry. 
the reason why I recommend Sean Terry, and there are a bunch of people that teach what he teaches. So if you don't subscribe to him, wh whatever, go to whoever you want to listen to. But the reason why I subscribe to him, someone introduced me to his podcast years ago at one of the lowest moments of my life, uh, what, personally and professionally as an entrepreneur. And it was his content that helped me get back into the real estate business. But even beyond real estate, I learned how to sell. I learned to fall in love with sales and I learned how to fall in love with fundraising, which is how I got into what I'm doing now. And so while he talks exclusively about real estate and how to build a successful real estate business without any money or very little investment, there's just the general business elements he talked about years ago changed everything. And at the time that I was listening to him, he had a hundred or so episodes he now is big time and charges for his content mm. but the podcast is still there and sometimes i still go back replay the old content because it's just that good and it reminds me of where i started from um so if any of his current content be a, be of any value feel free to tap into him another person that i subscribe to is russell brunson and all of his books if you can afford any of his content go right ahead but he is a guy that has uh, really mastered uh, funnels for businesses. So if you're into funnels or know what they are, what they do and how they can upsell, you know, uh, to other products, Russell not only has a platform for that, that which is his core business, he's written a trilogy of books that talks about how to monetize your expertise, how to find your tribe online, how to survive online, regardless of the algorithms, so on and so on. And again, it's not about, you know, Google and Facebook and Instagram and now Clubhouse. It's about the principles that he teaches. Yes. Those books are on rotation for me. Uh, one of the classics uh, Robert Kiyosaki, two things from him that I read repeatedly multiple times a year, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Mm -hmm. However, you have to also read the follow-up book, The Cash Flow Quadrant. If you've never read that book, he talks about what cash flow looks like for a business. It's on rotation for me. And in addition, and again, and I, maybe I should get sponsored by these people, but the, <laughs> the, the game Cash Flow by uh, Robert Kiyosaki, you can just Google the cash flow game. It's a digital game. Imagine uh, Monopoly on steroids. It teaches you about life and business, and it's a, it's a play off of his books. If you read his books and understand his books, then you'll understand how to play the game. If you don't understand business, you're going to lose at the game over and over and over again. But that game, I play multiple times a year just to remind myself of the principles. There are a bunch of other books, but there's one more that I always recommend, um, and, and I want to share it here. It's, it's, it's very similar to Rich Dad, Poor Dad, but it's a book called The Richest Man in Babylon. And it talks about how the Babylonians became wealthy way back when, but it highlights the basic principles of money management at the core. Even if you don't believe in God, even if you don't believe in a higher power, the book teaches that of 100% of your income, you should live off of a lesser percent and take a percentage of your income and begin the journey of investing, whether it's investing in a business, investing in stock, investing in real estate. It's not about the money. It's about the disciplined principle of just giving and feeding your vision. So those books are the ones that I always talk about. There are others in my in my uh, my, my my bookshelf that I read, uh, mm -hmm. but those are the ones that I just tend to go back to over and over and over again. Wow, awesome! Thank you so much. Yeah, we we really appreciate you being on with us and and sharing all this. I feel like we've all gotten so much value out of this conversation. I know our audience is gonna feel the same way. Absolutely. Uh, but before we go, we always like to ask every guest, uh, if our audience wants to be able to connect with you more uh, after listening to this podcast, where can they find you and connect with you? Yeah, the best place to connect with me is at drwilliampclark.com. That's where you can uh, schedule consults with me or tap into any of the amazing resources we've made available to business owners, business leaders, so on and so on. If you're looking for coaching, if you're looking for support, if you're looking for readable assets that can help you move the needle forward and kind of dig deeper in, in the areas we talked about today, drwilliampclark.com is the great place to find me. And on, on all social media platforms, you can find me at Dr. William P. Clark. Awesome. 
Thank you so much for being with us. Yes, Dr. Thank you so much. Perfect. This was such a great episode. And uh, for our listeners, for I, I hope you are taking notes because there's a lot. So come back and re-listen to this episode if you need to, um, to make sure that you get this all down. But yes, thank you so much, Dr. Clark. Thanks for having me.